All right, hello everyone. It's uh, just four minutes after four here on the eastern side of the country. Uh, hello to everyone from Florida. This is Jacob Kirsch on the line, uh, ready to start our webinar, our monthly webinar of great cardiac cases. Uh, we have uh, some good cases, uh, some really, really good cases. I know Dr. Denny is also on the call and she prepared some cases to share with all of us. Uh, but before we go there, let me get rid of this animation here. I did wanted to remind everyone, we are just a few weeks away from our annual meeting for the North American Society for Cardiovascular Imaging. Uh, as you all know by now, uh, the meeting is going to go virtual. We were planning to meet in Cleveland, Ohio. We had some really cool activities planned for our in-person meeting, but um, well, this year, a lot of things are happening, so we're going to be me meeting virtually. We have a fantastic program. I think we should quickly go through it. I think the first thing that you notice there on the on the cover of the program is at the boot camp on September 12th, which is a Saturday. That is free for everyone. Um, tell your friends, your trainees, your mentors, uh, your colleagues, your partners um, to try to make it to the meeting uh, and to register. You do have to go through nasci.org. Uh, that's nasci.org to register even for the free day of the boot camp. Everybody needs to be registered to be given access. Again, the meeting starts Saturday, September 12th with the boot camp. And then Sunday 13th and Monday 14th is the sessions, the scientific sessions and the presentation. So this is a boot camp. We have a cardiac CT boot camp session. We're going to have a cardiac MR boot camp, and then we have a very good session that's also included in this boot camp day. So again, free access. It's a year in review. So we have representatives from some of the most important cardiac imaging journals uh, giving us an overview of what happened, what was published in their own journals uh, in the last 12 months, in the last year. Uh, so what's really as out there and exciting in the literature for cardiac imaging in the last year? That's going to be on Saturday. Sunday? We start around 9.30 uh, a.m., 9.20 a.m. on the eastern side, so a little bit late for those in the eastern coast, but uh, very early, of course, for the Pacific side. But we start with the scientific sessions. We have our session on structural heart disease, and we're going to have our keynote speaker, our key, uh, Dr. Sven Polding keynote lecture um, by Dr. Samir Kapadia. Dr. Samir Kapadia is, is a structural cardiologist. He's going to be talking about advances in percutaneous treatment in both aortic and mitral valve disease. Dr. Kapadia is the chair, the chairman of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, uh, who just, uh, as of last week, the US News and World Report ranked as the number one heart center in the country for the 26th year in a row. So we're very, very excited and honored to have Dr. Kapadia join us um, in that session. Then we have a session on ischemic heart disease. And starting the session is Dr. Jim Young, uh, also from the Cleveland Clinic. He's going to talk about the history of coronary ang angiography. Um, for those who, do, who don't know this, Dr. Mason Soans at the clinic, at the Cleveland Clinic, he performed the first angiography uh, several decades ago, uh, and that's where it all started. So we're going to have a, a nice overview of the history and wh what happened in that cat lab that very, very day when the first angiography was performed. So Dr. Young... Uh, as a Cleveland Clinic uh, caregiver, he has access to really cool artifacts and images and videos and uh, documents related to the first coronary angiographies performed. Then on that afternoon, we're going to talk about technology, the American Heart Association session. So some of the best abstracts uh, are going to be presented and are going to be competing for a monetary reward courtesy of the American Heart Association. This is where we see some of our best science at the NASCI meeting, so everybody's invited. And of course, then we have sessions on hereditary cardiomyopathies and artificial intelligence and new technologies in the realm of cardiac imaging. On Monday morning, we start our second and last day with scientific sessions, followed by a session on pediatric cardiac imaging in our channel 2A, we're gonna have two concurrent sessions going on, one pediatric imaging, one in adult imaging. So we're gonna talk about pediatrics on one of them. And then on the concurrent session, that's the NASCI MITSI European Society of Cardiac Radiology with discussions on cardiac tumors and imaging in cardio-oncology. 
Then we're going to have, again, concurrent sessions on adult congenital imaging, and then another collaboration now with the study of thoracic radiology, discussing connective tissue dis disorder and the vascular disease. And in the afternoon, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies in one room and the pediatric vertical session in the other. And we're going to close that day uh, with uh, some good sessions on heart disease in women, coronary artery imaging in pediatrics, and at the very end, our very popular um, NASCI idol, as we like to call it. So we have some people presenting to us some of the craziest cases that they have seen in their career. So this is our experienced cardi cardiac imagers. They're going to show us some of the craziest stuff they've seen, and they're going to compete for a prize. So really excited about the meeting happening in a few weeks. Go to nasky.org, register the, the, for both the free bootcamp and the meeting. The rate for the meeting has been significantly discounted now that it's going virtual. It's at a $350 registration uh, for members and also for international um, imagers who may not be members but uh, are interested. Uh, there's a discount for those that do not live in the U.S. or Canada. They can take advantage of the membership rate as well. So make sure to tell your friends. I'm really looking forward to seeing as many of you there as possible. And having said that, I know Dr. Denny is anxious to show some of her cases. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Carol to present. So Carol, I'm going to be sharing with you the screen. There you go. Okay. You can see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so the first case is a 81-year-old uh, man with shortness of breath on exertion and atrial fibrillation. Okay. Are you seeing my moving move? I see your cursor, but the image is not scrolling. Never ending problems here. Um, okay, let's see if the corona will move. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, this was an example of a uh, coronary sinus uh, defect. So I will show just the still images. Hopefully, my other movies will work. Um, so you can see the slightly dilated uh, coronary sinus. And as you come down, um, firstly, the, you notice that the right uh, ventricle and the right atrium are uh, dilated. And as you come down, you can see that the wall between the coronary sinus and the uh, left atrium uh, disappears. And this is a coronal MIP. And so you can see the coronary sinus and the whole mid portion of the coronary sinus here is missing. So this is a very nice coronary sinus uh, defect. Uh, this patient uh, doesn't have a left SVC, persistent left SVC, which is often associated. So this is a left um, to right shunt causing uh, the right heart dilatation. So there's uh, different classifications. This is uh, the one that is most commonly used where you have type one, the completely unroofed sinus with a persistent left SVC, the completely unroofed without a persistent left SVC and the partially unroofed mid portion and the partially unroofed terminal portion. And then I just ran across this more complex um, classification where you have uh, complete unroofing um, with or without the uh, left persistent left SVC, the terminal uh, portion uh, with or without the persistent left SVC, the um, proximal portion, and then this small communication uh, with uh, the uh, left atrium from the coronary sinus again with or without the uh, persistent left SVC. 
So apologize about the movie not working on that. So uh, coronary sinus defect is probably the rarest of the um, ASDs, accounting for about one to 2%. And uh, it's pretty easy to miss them uh, if you're just scrolling axially. So uh, important uh, if you see a dilated coronary sinus, um, proximally to look for that uh, dilated right heart, of course, and uh, make sure you review the off-axis images. Um, another patient with a, uh, a uh, 48-year-old woman now with a dilated right ventricle on echo. And for some reason, my movies are not working. They were working earlier. Can you hit... Try, oh, it's a try, couple. Try hitting play instead of trying to scroll. Just hit the little... See if that starts it. Yeah, it's not. It's not. scrolling and it's not working. Yeah. Um, never ending. Um, so last month I tried to share and I couldn't share. So today my movies are not working. So um, we can perhaps um, uh, just look at these still images. Here we can see firstly that the right ventricle again is dilated, confirming uh, the findings on echo. And um, this is something that I uh, certainly walked by um, at the, uh, the first time that I looked at this MR. Um, and so if you go from um, the top images, the first two images, and I'll show you these um, still images. Here you can see that uh, this is the IVC and this is the right atrium here. And there should be a wall between the IVC um, and the right atrium, which is back, sorry, left atrium, which is back here. Uh, and so there should be a, a membrane or a wall here. So this uh, is an example of another type of, um, VS, of ASD. Does anyone know what this type of ASD is? So it's very inferior near the bottom of... That's correct. So this is an inferior sinus venosis um, defect and we, we did uh, axial and four chamber cines, but um, because we didn't do uh, thin images, so I guess it's important if you're looking for an occult um, ASD um, and you're having trouble finding it, uh, uh, make your images thinner because we, we couldn't see it on the axial or four chamber cines. And, uh, but we did pick it up on the, um, on the SAO cines here. Um, and the QPQS in this patient was 2.7. Now you can have an anomalous uh, inferior uh, pulmonary vein uh, on the right draining into the IVC as well, but in this case there was no anomalous vein. And I have a feeling that this movie is also not going to work. So these um, were also uh, showing the images in axial, much more obvious on CT, uh, on the coronal and uh, sagittal oblique, as well as the, uh, the axial images. Uh, again, because the images are much uh, thinner and you can uh, reconstruct them in all the planes. So just uh, the different types of, uh, of ASDs, this was the inferior uh, sinus venosis type. So you've got the coronary sinus that I showed earlier, the secundum, which is the most common in about 70% of individuals, and the superior sinus venosis defect, uh, most commonly associated with uh, anomalous pulmonary venous return of the right uh, upper lobe pulmonary artery. Um, and this was indeed missed on transthoracic echo uh, and can in fact be missed at, at surgery when there are other uh, anomalies associated. And it's uh, quite a rare type of ASD. Um, she did uh, present 12 months post-op with continued uh, shortness of breath and a right atrial mass on echo. Um, and uh, the cines again are not going to work, but um, there is a, a mobile mass uh, that was attached to the tricuspid valve uh, region around the annulus. Um, she did have a tricuspid valve annuloplasty at the time of her uh, sinus venosis ASD repair. Um, I 
did have some perfusion imaging showing that there was uh, no uh, perfusion, uh, no enhancement, and then this is the uh, late GAD image. So she had a thrombus uh, for some reason that um, that developed uh, at the site of surgery uh, that was just removed uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, bland thrombus rather than a vegetation, but that would be uh, in the differential. So I think I'll stop here and uh, I have another case, but maybe while uh, some others showcases, I'll see if I can get my movies uh, to go. That's okay, Jacobo. That's, yeah, of course. So anybody else who would like to to present the case while Carol tries to uh, work on those uh, videos? Don't be shy, guys. Kogo, hi, Sandeep here. I can present the case. Perfect, Sandeep. Let me find you here and uh, we'll make you presenter. I have a couple cases as well that I can show after you if Carol's not done by then. Um, okay. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. See, my last case doesn't have. Can everybody see my screen okay? It's a beautiful tree with the lake background yes <laughs> how about now yes looks great all right thank you very much uh, for everybody uh, joining us today uh, i'll be presenting a case of a woman in her 70s with uh, severe kyphoscoliosis and restrictive lung disease who presented with mitral stenosis with a peak gradient of 31 mm of mercury a cardiac CT was ordered for potential TMVR assessment. Before we go to the CT, here is her echo. This is a three-chamber echo, uh, which was done uh, transthoracic echo. This is not a transesophageal echo. Uh, so this is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. For those of you who are not used to seeing echoes, and here is the mitral valve. And you can see that there is a lot of classification of this mitral valve restricted opening, uh, and there is a, it's a very eccentric uh, mitral regurgitant jet as well. Here is an axial stack of her cardiac CT. As you can note, that her spine is all twisted, uh, consistent with the history that we have provided, uh, that she has a lot of. Uh, Hyposcoliosis going on. And I, in the interest of time, I can scroll and get to the mitral valve straight away. So here is her mitral valve. You can see this elongated leaflet and a lot of calcification of the leaflet. There is also some mitral annular calcification from the leaflet extending to the mitral annulus. And here is a 3D volume rendered image of uh, that mitral valve. And one thing that was striking on this image is particularly this anterior leaflet is elongated and there is nothing coming up from the posterior side. And here is a, uh, a corresponding uh, CT image that shows that there is no leaflet on the posterior side. So this is a uh, case of uni leaflet mitral valve. And uh, when we do TMVR measurements, we have to provide Apart from the annulus, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, but for sake of comparison, here is how a normal mitral valve should look anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. And the word mitral is derived from the shape of Roman Catholic bishop or Abbot's headwear that exactly looks like a mitral valve. So um, when we tried to do the TMVR assessment, one of the limitations we noted was uh, the new LDOT. So this is an area of LDOT that we are trying to predict by simulating a uh, device placement at the location of the mitral valve here. So when we simulated that, the new LDOT area that we got was about 1.33 centimeters square. And you need at least an area of 1.7 centimeters uh, per sec uh, square uh, to prevent a new LDOT obstruction. And because of that, uh, she was ruled out to be a candidate uh, for TMVR. And medical management was decided uh, that it's the way forward. And she 
noted uh, short-term improvement in her symptoms during the follow-up. I think uh, that's all I had for you. I'll turn it over to you, Jacobo, now. Thank you so much, Sandeep. That's a great case. Thank you for putting that together for us. Let's see. Uh, share my screen. All right. So I think you guys can see my screen. So why don't we start with this case that uh, the image is here. So this is uh, a transesophageal echo. And let's see if we can loop this. Um, let's look at the other echo here. View. I want to make sure we're looping. Okay, so we can see there that is uh, the tricuspid valve. We see closer to the probe at the top of the screen. That's going to be the right atrium. Remember, this is a transesophageal, so uh, we're looking. We're getting the probe is closer to the atria than the ventricles, and then on the bottom of the screen, that is the right ventricle. So we see significant tricuspid insufficiency there. We see that during systole that regurgitate and jet into the right atrium. The other loop that I was showing does not have Doppler. Let's make sure that we have this looping so we can see it continuously. So this is very low into that right-sided chamber. So we have here the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve around there. You see it opening and closing. This is where the IVC starts to drain into the right atrium. And you can see it looks kind of distended. And then what's really interesting is this little linear structure here. So there's a very thick crystal terminalis here inferiorly, very, very large. And then we see this very faint echogenic linear structure that goes towards the area of where the Eustachian valve is as well. So the echocardiographer here commented on it and raised the possibility of what the, we call a core triatriatum dexter. So these are very uncommon um, abnormalities, congenital abnormalities. We usually see them when we see them, again, very rarely on the left side, and we call them core triatriatum or core triatriatum sinister, meaning they happen on the left side. When they happen on the left side, which is the most common ones that we, we know of, um, we think that it's a sequela of um, poor incorporation of the pulmonary veins during um, the formation of, of the embryo. So the pulmonary veins do not fully incorporate into the left atrium and that orifice uh, where they join the atrium that remains as a membrane. So that membrane is what accounts for that on the left side it, type of core triatum. On the right side, it's uh, again, it's a membrane that has embryologic origin and is part of the membrane that creates a very long valve for the Eustachian valve. So that's a remnant of that. So we did an MRI on this patient and there's a lot of sequences. So just bear with me while we get the, the one that I believe can show some of this. It's a very difficult uh, or subtle finding. Uh, so here we go down to the bottom, we see that's a, a prominent IVC, and we start to see that membrane where the eustachian valve would be as well. And we see that the crystal terminalis is very prominent. It almost, uh, it not almost, it creates a big indentation between the appendage and the rest of the right atrium. So here it is, uh, and we can make it run. And we see again a jet of uh, susceptibility from that of flow from the tricuspid insufficiency. You can see that in systole. But again, a very prominent crystal terminalis. And it's again, really hard to see. I think probably the best images is those that we already showed, the axial ones, where we can see. This is We can see how prominent that you stick involved is that that membrane going towards the crystal terminalis. So it seems like it's a small persistent membrane, a core triatriatum uh, dexter, again, meaning on the right side. It's fenestrated, so it's not complete, has a large fenestration. So 
it has not created significant enlargement of the right atrium proximal to it. So that's one case. Again, we can keep scrolling, but I don't know if that we're going to get uh, much better images. Here we can see on this oblique coronal plane, we can see that jet of insufficiency in the tricuspid valve. Um, let's see. So we have now this is a study done for a pre-ablation or pre-isolation of the pulmonary veins. Um, and let's see, we have without contrast here. So this is the delays. Uh, I don't know where the without contrast are, but let's look at our images here. So this patient has a watchman device, a left atrial appendage occluder device. Again, we know that this is a patient on atrial fibrillation, and that's the reason we're doing the study for prior to pulmonary venous isolation. What was noted in this exam is that the attenuation of the rest of the left atrium was kind of higher than expected um, in this patient. So let's see if we can. So the Hounsfield units here is pretty high. It's a mean of 88 Hounsfield units in that area, which is much higher than you would get on an exam. And when, when you, you look at the delayed images, I want to get out of this. Let me see if I can move this there. Again, remains pretty high, uh, like the rest of the heart. So definitely, there's still communication between the the uh, the left atrial left atrium and the appendage post the device. Just a few nice uh, reconstructions here. And this, I don't know why the Osiris is doing that, but you can see there's more enhancement that you would expect on an unconscious. I had images on the scouts, which didn't transmit for some reason, that showed uh, significantly lower Hounsfield units in that area, in the area of like 30 Hounsfield units or so. So much less. So again, this is something that we see uh, relatively commonly, it happens in, immediately after the placement of the devices and eventually um, the left atrial appendage uh, starts to thrombose uh, within, uh, inside because of that very slow flow and you stop seeing this, uh, this communication, which is really hard to see uh, where the actual communication is. Uh, there's papers out there when, this is, when there's persistent communication, they go in and they put other uh, little amplats, uh, occluder devices to try to block that area of communication. That was not done in this patient. And let's see, I have this other patient. Hey, Jacob, yes. just real quick, you know, the magic number is five millimeters. So they look for a five millimeter channel because that's the threshold from the trial that was considered uh, significant. Um, and so typically if it's more than five millimeters, they'll go in and plug it. And put a plug? Yeah, cl yeah, clearly not. Channel. Yeah, clearly there was no five millimeter channel on this one. I couldn't even see a two millimeter one. Thanks, Mike. All right, in this case, um, so this is just an ugly case. Uh, let's look at the chest first and see what you guys think before I tell you what it is. So there's something there. There's something there maybe there, definitely down here. So a bunch of uh, pulmonary nodules uh, throughout. And then when we look at the heart and the soft tissue windows, something doesn't look right. Anybody wants to guess what this is? I mean, it's, uh, an, it's an ugly looking heart. Like, go, go, Julia. Go, it seems, seems like a myocardial involvement of some primary tumor, wherever, I don't know. <laughs> it comes. Yes. Also, so, long novel, secondary novel. 
yeah so and there's also some adenopathy here so yeah so definitely this is all this is actually all metastatic disease uh it's a metastasis to the heart uh it's a very significant i, I i've rarely seen these many lesions all over the heart you can see in these nodules in the right ventricular outflow tract all over the lv they're pretty much everywhere um and the patient has pulmonary nodules uh has adenopathy the primary on this patient uh, was a carcinoid tumor in the abdomen. So this is a patient with a abdominal car a carcinoid that metastasized to the chest um, um, and the lungs and the heart, of course. So just uh, one of the most extensive uh, cardiac metastatic involvement cases that, uh, that I've seen. So I just want to share that. And again, case of a carcinoid. Carcinoid, we all know, uh, can go to the heart and tends to go to the heart to some degree. All right, so those are the three cases that I had prepared for today. Uh, Carol, you want to see? You want to try and see if we can show that last case you had? Yeah, and my movies are working. Perfect. All right, let me find you here so I can make you presenter. There you are. You can even show some of the other movies if you want. Just uh, those were great cases. Yeah. All right, we see your screen. Sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll um, I'll just scroll through that uh, coronary sinus just so you can see kind of how um, can be a little bit tricky to pick it up on axial uh, images. So you can see signs of pulmonary hypertension here. The main right and left uh, pulmonary arteries are dilated. The right ventricle is really um, thick-walled, hypertrophied. Um, the right atrium is dilated. So, you know, you just scroll down and all of a sudden, if you're not paying attention, you won't notice that this uh, coronary sinus kind of blends in with the uh, left atrium and then you can see how dilated it is uh, distally. So it can be a little bit uh, tricky, but, uh, much easier to see on the uh, coronal MIP here. You can see that nice roof of the coronary sinus that's missing. So I'll just move quickly to the um, cines from the other case. And probably the to the next slide, you can see here the um, the shunt, the left atrium, and then you can see the 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 blood flow through the uh, ASD into the right atrium and the dilated IVC. So that's the inferior sinus venosus defect. and can be a little bit tricky to pick up on the axial image sorry i'll just scroll back and forth here just right here you can see the contrast going into the uh, ivc from the left atrium and then of course that communicates with the right uh, um, right atrium And you can see on this coronal, that communication right at the bottom of the um, interatrial septum. Okay, so let's. Uh, move to the, I think these don't add very much here, but you can appreciate on the perfusion, the dynamic perfusion, the lack of uh, contrast enhancement in this. And this patient had, you know, no infectious uh, symptoms. Um, she did have a PE scan and there was no uh, pulmonary embolism, so 
was not a clot in transit, uh, and it was uh, resected. So the last case is a 29-year-old man with a prior history of an illness um, as a child who presents with increasing shortness of breath on exertion and an echo that reveals severe pulmonary hypertension. And these are actually still images. So uh, I think you can appreciate uh, if you compare the diameter of the main pulmonary artery to the ascending aorta, uh, the main pulmonary artery is significantly dilated. And uh, there's also uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. I, I like the outflow tract. It's a good uh, area to look for um, hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Um, and in more inferiorly, you can see the right ventricle is very hypertrophied, thicker than five millimeters. And again, more inferiorly, you can see there is um, dilatation of the right ventricle and the right atrium, and there's actually septal bowing of uh, the septum towards the uh, left ventricle. So all signs of um, pulmonary hypertension. Um, but if you come back up, um, I don't know if you notice anything abnormal uh, in the mediastinum. So there's all this abnormal soft tissue, and if you look at the left atrium, it's markedly compressed, and the pulmonary veins are significantly narrowed. And here the right inferior pulmonary vein actually is, is occluded by this soft tissue. And then if you look here, there's a little bit of calcification. Um, I don't have an unenhanced scan, but that is calcification within that uh, soft tissue mass. So does anyone have an idea what we might be looking at? This is a lung window here with uh, some interlobular septal thickening and a bit of brown glass and a small right pleural effusion. So a bit of um, pulmonary edema because of the obstruction of the pulmonary veins. Anybody know what's going on? Uh, it could be involvement of the histoplasmosis, it could be <laughs> involvement of the mediastinal. Yeah, that's really great. So the differential here would be fibrosing medial Sinitis. Is this a tumor causing pulmonary venous obstruction? Is this chronic thromboembolic disease? Well, this, the, the soft tissue is outside of the uh, pulmonary arteries, definitely, so probably not that. And pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, well, we usually, we can see mildly enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum, but usually we don't see a soft tissue mass like this compressing the pulmonary veins. Usually the the venous um, obstruction is, is at the microscopic uh, level in the interlobular septae. Um, so this uh, is in a, a case of uh, fib fibrosing mediastinitis, most commonly due to uh, prior histoplasmosis, which, which is pretty common in the area of Canada that, that I live in. So just to review the findings, um, the main pulmonary artery is dilated, the right ventricle is dilated and hypertrophied, there's septal bowing, and then there's this soft tissue mass that is compressing the uh, left atrium and the pulmonary veins causing um, venous obstruction and secondary uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, and so this um, just, uh, that's the right inferior pulmonary vein again. This is the coronal reformat showing this uh, soft tissue mass. And then a 3D reformat showing the uh, narrowed uh, pulmonary veins. And there's a big collateral uh, from the right superior pulmonary vein, uh, sorry, from the inferior pulmonary vein that's occluding, occluded and then back up into the superior pulmonary vein on the right. Um, and so this patient had uh, stents uh, inserted in the uh, pulmonary veins, and uh, unfortunately, he's been lost to a follow-up, so I can't give you an update on how he's doing, but uh, uh, that's uh, fibrosing mediastinitis. Just some pulmonary edema. Nice. That's my last one. 
Perfect. That's that's really great. Thank you, Carl. That's a great case. And sorry, sorry that you know we have to go back and forth a little bit to for the technical issues. Anybody else out there who wants to share a case? I have some simple case, Jacobo, <laughs> but it's in Spanish, but I can tell you we can uh, practice in English. Spanish. I can practice my Spanish. That's great. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Let me make you <laughs> practice. <laughs> All right. Let's compartir. Uh, let's see. Perfect. Can you see? Yes, we can see it. Okay. The clinical history is a 49 years old female. The, the medical uh, doctor has for a CT because they look at the echo, uh, this thing here in the right ventricle, yeah, the right atrium, excuse me, left ventricle, left atrium, and here the mitral valve. You can see something that is maybe calcified or a mass. And they order a CT um, looking also for the coronary arteries. Let me see, I cannot here. This is a calcium score. The coronary arteries look without calcium, but there is a lot of calcium around the, in the pericardium also, around the mitral valve. And here, if you change the windows, you can see the mitral annulus calcified. Here are the volume rendering reconstructions. The coronary arteries are normal and it seems no constriction in the movement of the heart. And the MRI shows uh, the, the calcium here at the level of the mitral annulus. There are no a normal movement of the, let me see, the interventricular septum. It doesn't look like a constriction. And that was a case of the calcification of the pericardium or also of the mitral valve. And we have like two cases like this. That's it, <laughs> simple. It's not so simple, it's a great case. Beautiful images. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else out there who wants to share a case? Uh, let's see. How, how, how can I stop to share mine? Don't worry. I'll, I'll share mine so you can do your thing. Okay, perfect. All right, guys. So, um, Seems like that's uh, that's what we have for today. Uh, thank you all for joining and thank you to those who put the time and the effort on for preparing cases to present and uh, really appreciate it. Again, we're just a few weeks away from the NASCI meeting. Uh, spread the word. I would love to see all of you there. It's a fantastic program. It's really, really great speakers, uh, great people to hang out with, even though it's virtually, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So really looking forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you so much. Stay safe and we'll see you around at the meeting and at the next webinar. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.